Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the World of Cock and Calf podcast. My name is Eric Schmitz. And I'm Donald Wine. And our friend Jonathan could not join us tonight, but we are here because this is the most wonderful time of the year. It is Cock and Calf Nations League. And I. The group stage. The, the group stage. stage. That we wish that we could participate in again. One, one day, right, Eric? Yes, I, I am eagerly anticipating the day where the United States is participating in this again. But really, like the group stage of CONCACAF Nations League is the essence of what is what is beautiful about CONCACAF. Uh, we saw some great action. We saw some wonderful nonsense happening in this window. Um, the first window of the 2024-25 CONCACAF Nations League. And I think we just need to recap it. Recap all the nonsense for those of you who did not consume all of it like we did. So the, the also the great thing, though, and I, I want to shout out Paramount Plus uh, and CBS for how they were able to stagger a lot of these games there. It felt like a point, Eric, where, you know, there was a couple of windows where there was like more than two games going on. But if you had like a TV and an iPad or a tablet of some sort, you could watch just about every game because they usually only had one or two games on at once. And it's very rarely that they have like a block where I think it was yesterday uh, where they had a block in the afternoon where there was like four games at a time, which, okay, cool. But I think what they did was great as far as staggering. They even had a game at 11 a.m. yesterday. Uh, yeah. Eastern time. Um, so it was great how CONCACAF and, and I, I don't know if Paramount had anything to do with it, but at least CONCACAF was able to stagger some of these games so that you were able to see as much action as possible. Yeah, and I mean, before we get into what actually happened, I think related to that, we did see some players actually complaining about the game times because you're playing games in the afternoon. It is September. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with September in the Caribbean, but it is still hot as shit during the day. And muggy and sticky and And sometimes wet. And you've got multiple games within a couple days span. And it's not necessarily the best best environment for top level soccer. And this was the first window of CONCACAF's new pods where League B and League C were playing in central sites. So uh, and that that had a lot to do with it because obviously I, it had a lot to do with those it teams can't play at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> they've got one good field on the island, you know. And maybe or maybe not lights. So you're playing those games early in the day. And you saw some of the games were affected. But in the end, it's CONCACAF. Magic is going to happen regardless. Yeah. So I think right now we just need to kind of recap. We'll go through each league. We'll talk about what the standings are halfway. Well, for so, for League A, it's halfway through the group stage. For Leagues B and C, it is a third of the way. But we will um, go through each league and let you know where everyone's sitting at. Talk about like the the important things that happened. Uh, so Donald, I think we start start with the best. You know, League C is where League it's C. at. Um, and you want to go ahead and recap the standings? Yeah. So there's three groups of three teams in League C. So let's start with Group One. Group One has Barbados sitting atop with six points. You have Bahamas in second with one point and a minus one goal differential. And then the U.S. Virgin Islands are sitting in third place in group one with one point, but a minus three goal differential. Moving on to group two, you have Belize in first place with six points. They have a plus five goal differential. We'll talk about that in a second. Anguilla, shout out them, three points in second place with a plus one goal differential. We will talk a lot about that in just a second. And Turks and Caicos sitting in third place with zero points and a minus six goal differential. Finally, we have group three and group three is St. Kitts and Nevis. You remember St. Kitts and Nevis made the drop down to uh, league C, uh, but they're sitting in first place with six points. Cayman Islands in second place with three points and the British Virgin Islands round out group three. They're at the bottom with zero points. Yeah. Um, I know we've got a couple things that we want to hit on first, just real quick. I saw that, Group C was playing at Truman Bod Sports Complex. I didn't sure get was. Enough, I did not get enough shots of the pool during the broadcast. 
Um, but shout you out. You know what's funny? Adams. I I I was watching. You know, I, you know how you turn on game. It's in like the. I was staggering between games, so I was like, "All right, I'll turn turn on this game." It's in the you know thirty seventh minute, and I turn on the game, and I did. It was one of those. It wasn't Cayman Island, so I didn't know who where it was. All I saw was the pool. And so I was like, oh, I know where that is. I know where they're playing. And they didn't have to say anything. And then you kind of panned over. I was like, yep, I know that grandstand. I know exactly where they're playing. Truman Baden, that's where they are. Yeah, wonderful place. Uh, shout out Cayman Islands for getting the win in their opening match on an 84th minute goal uh, from Elijah Seymour. You know, it, it's good to see the home team win. But I think the big story out of League C is a game that the home team did not win. Uh, our boys and Donald, what jersey are you wearing tonight? I'm wearing Anguilla. Anguilla. Anguilla, the beloved brothers of our podcast, ranked 209th in the world in the FIFA rankings, opened up their 24-25 Nations League with a victory. The first competitive victory since 2010. The first competitive victory over a FIFA team since 2001 with a 2 nothing win over the Turks and Caicos Islands at the TCIFA National Academy in Providenciales. And I believe their first ever away competitive win, right? Yes, like, that's true. So also shout out the bottom of the standings because it was very good window for the very bottom uh, teams. Anguilla gets their first win. San Marino gets their first win in 20 years. They're the only team I think ranked lower than Anguilla is so uh yeah that it, it was a, it was a magical a magical day and the score line I think was even more impressive yes no for sure we try to be CONCACAF focused here but I think it's CONCACAF it it puts into context to see that it's like Anguilla they got that win but then San Marino like San Marino is always saying oh yeah we're better than this they tried playing St. Kitts and Nevis and being like oh yeah we can beat CONCACAF teams they couldn't got got molly too yeah. yeah but it's good to see San Marino get it like these bottom end teams like this was a great window for the bottom of the FIFA rankings and it's gonna be really interesting to see with the new calculations where they are gonna fit because yeah Anguilla got a competitive win over a team ahead of them in the standings um two nothing win uh they got the goals from jermaine hughes and lamar carpenter in the second half to get the victory just a wonderful day for soccer in anguilla and i think the other thing right is you know anguilla was always at the bottom of the standings not necessarily just because they were losing but because they also didn't play a lot of games right they'd play like you know, before Nations League, they'd play two games a year, maybe, uh, and or there'd be years that go by where they didn't play uh, because nobody wanted to play them. And at least with San Marino, they're losing every window, right? They got two games every window. They're losing them until at least until this window. And so they were at the bottom because not only they had volume and all the losses to to pile up. And so I'm wondering how Anguilla now that they are starting to get back to competitive games. You know, they they lost their second game, but as as we saw, it was very competitive all the yeah. way to the end. One and nothing so, result. One nothing result. And so I, I'm wondering if it's and that was against Belize. So I'm wondering if that is, you know, first of all, Nations League is clearly helping. This is this is what it was made for, teams mm-hmm. like Anguilla, to get competitive games for them to just get that volume, get the you know, consistency going. And then eventually the the hope is that they get better. And now I wonder how that factors into the standings guys. They're not going up from 209 to like, you know, one nine, you know, one ninety seven. but do they move up in the rankings because of this win? Because again, it was a very good window for the bottom of the stand of the rankings. Yeah. Well, they beat Turks and Caicos who's currently ranked 206. So 209 beat 206. Uh, Belize was ranked 183. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a little bit of a gap there. Um, but yeah, rough window for Turks and Caicos. You get to host the two games. You lose both games at home. You're losing to the worst ranked team in CONCACAF. Um, do want to shout out, though. I don't know if, for those of you that saw the highlights from that Anguilla met victory. Uh, the first goal, kind of rough. Keeper bobbles it, just leaves it on a platter, get punched in. Um, ter- do you see that Turks and Caicos keeper was Samuel Harvey? 14 years old. Yo, 
he was born on October 15th, 2009. Do you remember, I, I keep talking I ha- because I'm pretty sure that that date is very important. Uh, and I'm going to look up this game <laughs> because I mean, it is I right can believe it's, time. I could believe it's important. Like I ha- I mean, I've got half my closet. It's probably older than that kid. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready to blow your mind. All right. Let's see it. The Charlie Davies game here in DC, John Bornstein. That game was the day before he was born. Oh, my God. He was not alive to see that magic because <sighs> he was coming the next day. We, uh, Harvey, I looked it up. He plays for Cheshire Hill Pirates FC. Um, we're going to when we do. We haven't done Turks and Caicos yet, but we're still saving that for real team or fake team because Cheshire Hill Pirates. That's and. Badass. And there is a, uh, you know, looking back, there is a Lawrence Harvey that played a couple matches for Turks and Caicos. He was England born, but represented the Turks and Caicos in 2004, I want to say. I don't know if they're related, um, but it would appear that they could be right They're in that range where not necessarily, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess father, son, but also could be like uncle, cousin, what have you, some sort of relative. Uh, but yeah, when I saw the name Harvey, I was like, hold on. This kid. I mean, literally, my my legal career is older than him. <laughs> I mean, That's, yeah. Like in his defense, like looking at the transfer market page for the national team, uh, it's got their average age for the roster at twenty one point four. That there's a lot of 15, 16, 17 year olds on the squad, like Billy Forbes, the star striker. He's 33. He is bringing that average up a lot. He's throwing mm-hmm. off the curve. Um, well, it's kind of so, like the U.S. team, right? Like, there's a bunch. I mean, for a while, it was a bunch of kids and Tim Ream. So, like, you, yeah. you kind of have you need to have the the, the balancer uh, on the other side. Yeah. Um, so, learning experience for Turks and Caicos, but big window for Anguilla. Um, I do want to point out that because the second plate because of there's three groups and they're in league C and four groups in league B, there will be a second place team that gets promoted out of league C who is currently the highest ranked second place team in league C Donald. It's been dolphins, man. It's been dolphins. Anguilla. Anguilla. And they've got a plus three goal difference advantage over Cayman islands for that top second place spot. So Anguilla going up to League B would just be massive, but right. there's still they some got, windows to play, and they still got two games left. Uh, I, you know, again, like against Belize and against Turks and Caicos, but I, I, you, you have to be proud of how far they've come. And I mean, when we started this podcast, one of the first things we did, like the jersey that I'm wearing, obviously, you all uh, listening to this can't see it, but it's it's like the jersey that came out like around the first episode of this podcast. Uh, one of those three that Stimulus put out. Shout out Stimulus. But mm-hmm. to see wearing this jersey and knowing how they were getting absolutely bow beasted in every single game that we would watch, we'd be like, "Oh, they're going to score a goal." They finally scored a goal. Now we're like, "Oh, maybe they'll get a get a point." They finally got a point. Now we're talking about their first win uh, in a very long time. So uh, you can just see the progress that they've made. Yeah, and that Belize match, the second one, like all the sports books had Belize giving three and a half goals. Like the line was Belize minus three and a half was like the standard one. And that was a one Oh game. So Anguilla putting up some great performances. Uh, Donald, there is one other game that we wanted to touch on. How about I use Virgin islands game? Yeah. So U S Virgin islands, first of all, we will talk about it a little bit later, but the U S Virgin islands dropped some absolute fire kits. Oh, uh, yes, kits. Absolute fire. And and I have already ordered one. Just putting that out there. Out uh, of they, Hummel. It, out of Hummel. Yeah, Hummel has a new, they have a new Hummel site uh, that has three new jerseys, a home, away, and a third. Each one of them are banging. The reason why it took me like 12 hours to order it is because I spent 11 hours and 59 minutes deciding which one I was going to buy. <laughs> uh, I ended up going with the home yellow. Uh, but okay. there's a, a light blue away one that's absolute heat. And then the I'm third the is a one. black one um, that has a it has like a, a you know, a Chevron with um with a plaid like 
tartan uh like pattern across it v lots of colors very very cool they're online check them out but i will say this not only did they look good they were able to use that mo mojo to conjure a 3-3 draw against the bahamas they were down 3-1 in the 58th minute but they got a goal by rakeem joseph in the 77th minute in the 86th minute they were able to equalize with a goal by Gabriel Cantone Highfield. So uh, that, I, I mean, look, U.S. Virgin Islands, they've been struggling for a while. I remember we were talking about the the, uh, the Virgin Islands derby uh, in World Cup qualifying and early World Cup qualifying, and they were struggling, but they were able to at least get that point, and that keeps them alive, at least maybe not to win the group because Barbados is so far ahead right now. But maybe to get into that, you know, again, fight with Angola to maybe get into that picture for that top second place team. Yeah, the Bahamas U.S. Virgin Islands game in the next window is it going to be uh, a great match? A uh, lot, lot at stake there. Um, so yeah, wonderful kickoff day. Yeah, September fourth had us that three three draw with the Virgin Islands Bahamas. It had Anguilla getting their first dub. It had Cayman Islands getting that late win over British Virgin Islands. You, you couldn't have started Nations League any better. Um, so, wonderful League C here in September. Let's move on to League B. League B, we've again, we've got four groups. Uh, we'll just run through the standings real quick. In Group A, we've got El Salvador leading the way with six points. St. Vincent, the Grenadines, shout out Vincent Heat. Uh, they've got four points. Bonaire, which hosted the matches this window, sitting in third at one point, and Montserrat with zero points. In Group B, we've got St. Lucia, first place, six points with two wins. Curacao with three points. Grenada, who hosted this window, with three points. And St. Martin, the French one, with zero points. In Group C, Haiti leads the way with six points and a plus nine goal difference, which puts him in a good spot. Puerto Rico sitting on three points after hosting this window. Uh, the Dutch St. Martin with three points in third place. And then Aruba sitting in the relegation zone with zero points in fourth place. And finally, in League leagues B, Group D, we've got the Dominican Republic with six points, Bermuda with three points, Dominica with three points, and then Antigua and Barbuda who hosted this window, walked away with two losses and zero points and sitting firmly in the relegation zone. Donald, let's talk about storylines. Before we but get to the storylines, I, I did want to point out, uh, you know, we talked about this when they did the draw for uh, all these different groups back in, what was it, May? Um, and we discussed the fact that League B was 15 island countries in El Salvador. And we were saying, hey, we love El Salvador. El Salvador has been great to us, but El Salvador's got to go. They got to, they got to, <laughs> they can't be promoted up to uh, League A because we, we are, we are Team Island here on this podcast. We are CFU all the way. Of course, the one non island country is leading uh, their group uh, to get up. So uh, naturally, we're going to have at least three island countries that are promoted to League A, which is great. We'll talk about League A in just a in, in a little bit. But El Salvador is, uh, you know, contrary to again, we're not, we're not we're doing this with all love and respect, but they are they are going against our wishes right now. Um, and Vinci Heat's right right on their heels. Uh, but I thought it was interesting of the one island country out there. They are one of the teams in first. Yeah. So staying in Group A, what's the first storyline for you? So yeah, look, Bonaire. I think the first thing you mentioned they hosted in their, you know brand new stadium they were one of the hubs for this window and to be able to host both games is a really big deal unfortunately they were not able to uh take advantage of it they were able but however they were able to ink out a draw against Vinci Heat and I thought that game was very electric um I I saw most of it uh because again that was one of those windows the few windows that had multiple games going on uh mm -hmm. and not just in CONCACAF but like football and other stuff like that but it, it, it's interesting because Bonaire, it, again, feels like a team that with this new stadium could start to build something. And they had an opportunity to gain some momentum by hosting the matches and also having teams on the road 
uh, it at their house. Uh, and they just unfortunately were not able to take advantage of that. They're sitting in third place. They have one point. They uh, were able to draw against St. Vincent. And I thought that part was really good. But I thought they missed a real chance here to kind of move themselves up and maybe go and be a team that's poised to go at El Salvador. Yeah, I mean, they put up a really good fight against El Salvador in their second match. Uh, El Salvador won that one 2 one Bonaire got a late stoppage time goal to get that mm-hmm. 2-1 result. But El Salvador only scored one. Like, it was an own goal that opened the scoring right in first half stoppage time. Um, El Salvador wasn't necessarily... Like, they've got their results. They got two wins. But they weren't necessarily, you know, impressive in these two matches they obviously got that 2-1 win over Bonaire they beat Montserrat in the first match but I watching the games I wasn't I didn't feel like they played up to the level that you would expect from El Salvador with this group yeah I agree and I think the other thing is that we have to remind ourselves is I might be painting them uh in a you know being a little harsh on them because they were just promoted to League B so Mm -hmm. this is Again, them kind of stepping into the fray here. But again, I, I think there's an opportunity here for them to make some noise. And they may have missed. It. They're learning that in League B, you got to take your shots when you get them. And yeah. this was an opportunity to get, you know, maybe not six points, but at least get four. Uh, and they only end up with one. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Group B, the big story, St. Lucia. Um getting a 2-1 win over Curacao. I mean, Dick Advocat's squad, the Curacao squad, really, really disappointing showing. Uh, but great result for St. Lucia, getting the 2-1 win. And then going off that win over Curacao, which is a massive win for them, uh, they play Grenada, the host team, and they get a 2-1 win over Grenada at Karani James Athletic Stadium. So... What a massive window for St. Lucia uh, sitting at six points atop the group. Uh, you would say that they're safe from relegation with that many points already, but I mean, Curacao was not necessarily thrilling to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, if St. Lucia gets worked on against Grenada and St. Martin. They could be moving up and league A is where they deserve to be as a league A team. You know, you know, I first of all, St. Lucia looked great um, and they looked good in their uniforms while doing it. Uh, yes. But also, I, I know we were gonna mention, yeah, uh, I know we were going to mention this, that the hub for these matches was Karani James Stadium and the field was in terrible shape. Yes. Terrible shape. Uh, and, and I'm not sure in, uh, in their ahead, defense, in their defense, they had storms roll through relatively yes. recently. Like that island has dealt with enough. We don't want to be ripping them for the f- condition of the field, but when you're moving to a hub situation and this is the look that you get on the broadcast, it it looks rough. I don't know how it played. We weren't there, but those fields did not look great. Well, it so when I, and I think you're the same way, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, or anyone else out there. But when I say that the field looked terrible, it was not a shot at the country. It's not a shot oh, yeah. at Karani James Stadium. We yeah. have been there. We, we'd love to shout out, there. shout out sizzle, time. shout out sizzle. Um, it, it was a great, great time. But when you have these sort of things, again, a hub situation means that you're going to this place because you think they have the best facilities, the best fields, all this stuff. And if the field is not ready for play for whatever reason, that's okay. But then you have to consider other options that I know is probably they f- probably felt it was too late to maybe deviate from that. But it did affect the play. There was definitely times where guys were playing around those big patches that were on the field. And that maybe affects sight, you know, lines of passing and affects, you know, guys who are running through. And especially when it started raining, those spots became muddy. And so guys tried to avoid that as well. And that slowed the game down a little bit. So I I think the main issue with the field not being great is that it affected the play in the sense that guys had to think about how they approached it. They had to think about going around certain parts of the field or avoiding certain parts of the field. And that may play to or away from the strengths of some of these teams, right? If you have a good midfield, that midfield was neutralized by the fact that they could move around 
in that center patch because there was no grass there. Uh, contrary, if you have a guy that's fast and you maybe give him some extra, some deeper spikes and you send him long and that ball skids just enough and then hits a patch and then stops just right on the foot of a guy, turn a lucky, you know, turn a lucky play into a goal. So those are things that I know CONCACAF is addressing it. Again, there may not have been a way to avoid this, uh, but forget the what it looks like on TV. Forget all that. I'm more concerned about a safety of players and b how it plays for them and how that affects how the game transpires. Well, I mean, talk about how it looks on TV mattering. Like we're trying to build up this competition to mm-hmm. to be pre- as prestigious as it actually is. Like it is the preeminent competition in global soccer. So it's got to look the part too. It's got to look saying. the part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the magic of CONCACAF, like what you see in the backgrounds, we talk about what the views are beautiful, but the important part is making sure the, the field itself looks like it's top level competition. And I will say that I watched a lot of soccer in this window as I, as I know you did. Yeah, I watched a great. lot of soccer from all over the world. I think I watched a game in every single confederation, at least one in every single confederation. Every single confederation had shitty fields. Mm -hmm. Every single confederation has to deal with this. There was games that were suspended due to rain. There's games suspended because there were, I mean, it turned one game uh, I was watching turned into a lake uh, and they still tried to play through it. It was kind of like that gold women's gold cup uh, semifinal that I went to in San Diego was worse than that. And they still tried to play through it until the ball just would not, if you tried to kick it, it wouldn't yeah. go anywhere. But you have these the things. But the thing is, is when you think about it, all these competitions had terrible fields or fields that weren't up to snuff. But no one talks about it like they do CONCACAF. And that's where we come yeah. in is to say, hey, there's a reason for this. It affects the play. And we do need to call out that part of it. But it is not about, for me, it is not about the aesthetics of it because if I wanted to see another shitty field, I don't have to turn on the TV for CONCACAF. I can turn on the TV anywhere in the world yeah. and they all have to deal with the same problems. But again, if you're doing this in World Cup qualifying, people are going to have a bigger issue with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, shitty fields are everywhere, but vibes, that's kind of vibes are Vibes are present only here. All exactly. Right. Uh, before we move on from League B, any other things you want to point out? Yeah, Haiti is beating everybody's ass <laughs> straight up um, led by D- uh, Duckins Nazan. Uh, he had four goals. He had three in one game, but they beat Puerto Rico four to one. They beat St. Martin, the Dutch side six nil in watching that game. I don't know if you watched that game, but the last 15 minutes, mm-hmm. they just worked them like a part-time job. It was, it was quite impressive for Haiti uh, again, especially all that they as a nation, as their team has gone through. Uh, for them to be able to just come out and just put their heads down and go to work uh, on these two teams was uh, was really, really interesting to watch. And they look like the runaway favorites. We we knew that they were, but mm-hmm. they look every bit the part of a team that looks like they're trying to get back in a league. Game. Yeah. And I know Puerto Rico, I had heard they were missing some players, just a tough window for them. They did get scratch out the 1-0 win over Aruba on a late goal. Um from Leandro Lopez. Um, but yeah, Haiti getting goals in the 75th, 82nd, 80, uh, 75th, 77th, 82nd, 85th uh, to really run away from St. Martin. I mean, the goal difference is going to come into play here. Um, so Haiti looks like they've got a good shot to uh, get promoted and qualify for the Gold Cup, which is next summer. Um, all right. Let's move on to League A. Donald, where are the League A standings sitting right now? So halfway we have stage. Yeah, so we have we're halfway through the group stage. We have two groups in Group A. Costa Rica is atop the the group with four points. They have a plus three goal differential that is one above Guatemala, who is in second place, also on four points. Third place is Suriname with three points. Guadalupe also has three points. They're in fourth. Uh, they. Uh, Suriname has a plus one goal differential, Guadalupe with a minus two. And then finally, fifth and sixth place are are Guyana and Martinique, both of them sitting on one point with a minus two goal differential. So that's group A of League A. Group B has Jamaica sitting in first place alongside Nicaragua. Jamaica is in first place, four points, plus one goal differential. Nicaragua, the same 
stat line, but they are in second place. I think it's another tiebreaker that's that's further down the line. Honduras is in third place, three points. Uh, Cuba is in fourth place with two points. French Guiana is in fifth place with one point and a minus one goal differential. And Trinidad and Tobago, who was in the Nations League quarterfinals against the United States, was in the Copa America playoff and lost to Canada back in March. We were at that game as well. They are in fifth, or I'm sorry, they're in sixth place with a one point. Uh, they have one point right now in a minus four goal differential. Yeah, and the quick thing I want to point out is the first place team sitting on four points. Last year, we did have one team, Trinidad and Tobago, got off to that hot start, got mm-hmm. six points in that first window, and was able to use that hold on. to yeah. hold on and get to through to the quarterfinals. Everything is still up for grabs the way it's looking right now. Um, I think for it, is, me- it is interesting to note, because I know we were talking about, I know we've been talking about, uh, you know, where are we going to go? Where is the United States going to play? Who's Mexico going to play? Canada and, and um, uh, who am I thinking of? Panama. Yeah. But the idea is when you're looking at last, the last year's uh, second place teams, Trinidad and Tobago, you mentioned they got off to that hot start. They got six points. They finished with nine. So they didn't do well in the second, in the October window. Meanwhile, the other second place team in Group B was Honduras with seven points. So there's still some maneuvering here. And when we get into later, we'll probably talk about some of the matchups that are left. Um, There's going to be some movement here. And it's really, I mean, this is a much tighter window than we had last time around where we kind of had, I mean, it was down to like four or five teams, at least from an American standpoint of who we were going to play. Right now that we can't say that uh, because it really is up for grabs. Yeah. I mean, looking at standings is up for grabs, but because of the scheduling, we'll touch on that. I don't know if it's actually that close. Um, yeah. There's some, there's some teams who have a much tougher schedule than others. Let's say that. Yeah. Um, so first off the big result, I think in group B uh, Jamaica, their first match was hosting Cuba zero zero draw at the office in Kingston honestly a terrible way to start very listless for Jamaica um under a new coach too and they were able to rebound they got a 2-1 win in Honduras but not a great way to start out the window for Jamaica who's expected was the number one seed and expected to get through yeah they're they're I mean they're one of the class teams. And I mean, when we're talking about Jamaica, we have for the last five years, we've talked about them competing for the 2022 world cup. We thought they were going to be a team with all those new uh, influx of dual nationals, that they would be a team that would compete for one of those spots. But now they really are one of the teams that are, are certain to try and go after one of these new spots in CONCACAF. There's what three that are guaranteed to get into the 2026 World Cup, and then two more who will go to the big playoff that they're doing. Jamaica not being one of them would be unacceptable, period. Uh, But really, they're a team that, in their minds, and in my mind at least, should be competing to be one of those three teams, extra teams that get into the World Cup alongside the three hosts. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just me picking and choosing, but this was the first competitive match under Steve McLaren, new coach mm-hmm. in Jamaica. Um, I noticed across CONCACAF, a lot of the new coaches, the team struggled early. And that's just a matter of, yeah, it's international soccer. You get a new coach. It's tough to implement your style of play when you're playing a team that's going to be competitive, has an identity, and is going to play with intensity. It's tough to get a result, even at home. Uh, so rough start for Jamaica. Yeah. And I mean, segue to another team that I thought did uh, actually pretty well, uh, kind of surprising in my mind, Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua is right now in second place. And, you know, against French Guiana, they had a epic 95th minute goal uh, from Weidman Talavera to win. And that's part of the reason why they are second in Group B. Um, and of course, uh, Talavera actually didn't even start the game. He came on as a substitute in the 55th minute and watching that game again, it was in my mind, it was actually one of the, you know, air quotes, boring games. Like it wasn't a lot of action. And then all of a sudden it was just like lightning in a bottle and, you know, Talavera scores the goal 
and Nicaragua turns what was probably a listless draw that would have had them probably down in fourth or fifth place in the standings. Now they're in second. In fact, they were in first uh, before Jamaica played uh, and, and won late. So they're the last game of the window. So uh, it's very, very cool to see them, A, you know, getting to that point. But also it's a team that, you know, we talked about them having the ineligible player. We just had the laser focus against them. So it's a little bit more front of mind to watch them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm glad that they are are doing well. And again, when we talk about the schedule, will they maintain it is the question. There's, there's a lot they got to do. There's a lot of work they have left. Yeah. I mean, this could have been a very different window for Nicaragua outside of stoppage time at the end of the match. They get this the 95th minute winner to get a 1-0 win over French Guiana. And then their second match in Cuba, they're down 1-0 heading into stoppage time. And you get a 97th minute equalizer from Harold Medina. And all of a sudden, Nicaragua is sitting in second place and Mm -hmm. potentially advancing to the quarterfinals. And just two magical moments that dramatically change the window for Nicaragua. Um. The other game that I thought was entertaining that I ended up watching for a zero zero draw, I felt like there was a lot of back and forth. Trinidad and Tobago, French Guiana ending zero zero. One of many stoppages we saw this window where the lights went out in the stadium. They actually played this one at Dwight York Stadium in Bacolet, which is on Tobago. Mm-hmm. So it's not even playing at their main stadium, not even playing Cuba or anything on the like it was a very different atmosphere uh, for Trinidad and Tobago. And they go to this smaller stadium on Tobago and the lights go out in the middle of the game. Very conca That it, it probably didn't even phase either team because it's something that we're used to watching. Yeah. Uh, it's something that we're used to seeing. Uh, we've been to places that don't have uh, lights. So like, they're like, Hey, lights can't go out here because we don't have them. So um, it, it's yeah, it's, it's interesting. Also, I thought the, the going to Dwight York Stadium was an interesting choice for them. Um, they they don't play in Tobago much. Uh, there's not as many. You know, Trinidad obviously has the big population. The the island, um, Port of Spain has the big population, but it's uh, I think I mean, Port of Spain is one of the you know most populous cities in the Caribbean, and mm-hmm. so it makes a lot of sense to play there all the time. It makes a lot of sense to even you know even sometimes to go to Cuba, which is you know not that far away. Um, so it was a is in a way it's kind of a gamble for them to play uh in Tobago. So um well again, the announced lights attendance, out, whatever. Yeah, was the that? announced attendance was twenty one hundred. So I'm sure they could have used more ticket sales. Yeah, and, and it's that's whatever, right? Because I mean Housley Crawford is what eighteen thousand or something like that now. Yeah. Um and they've scaled that back over the years because you know, in nineteen ninety, I think it was thirty five thousand. Now it's down to you know, now it's half that. And of course, last time we were there, not as many, you know, there was not a lot of people there at that match either. But I think it's more about Trinidad and Tobago just not really having a, a lot of momentum, right? You would think that them getting to the quarterfinals and then potentially almost getting into the, you know, Copa America would have been enough to kind of help boost things. But it's it's almost like they are treating this the way other people are treating, uh, you know, you know, friendlies. And they're just kind of like, yeah, we're not really concerned about this. Call us when you get good. Uh, and they tried to, you know, bring in some new fans by moving it to the other island. And, you know, not a lot showed up, but they also get the draw. So, you know, I guess all's well that ends well, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, and I guess we, sh- we should talk about now, like, what, where we stand with the two groups. Uh, because as you know, the top two teams will move on to the quarterfinals. The uh, lowest ranked second place team will play Mexico. The highest ranked second place team will play the United States. And then the top ranked teams will play Canada and Panama as well. Right now in group A, we've got Costa Rica, number one, Guatemala, number two. And in group B, we've got Jamaica, at number one, and Nicaragua, at number two. Now, because of goal difference, the all four teams are sitting at four points. So the current standings are... You've got Jamaica, you've got uh, Costa Rica, the number one overall with a plus three goal difference. You've got Jamaica is the second best first place team with a plus one goal difference. And then of the second place teams, the third ranked team would be Guatemala. 
with a mm-hmm. plus two goal difference and Nicaragua with a plus one goal difference. Now, because of the insane Swiss style scheduling that CONCACAF has decided on under this current format of Nations League, you've got some really interesting matchups in this October window to look forward to. And I hope we'll we'll do like a, a massive preview before the window, but I think it's worth talking about now. What sticks out to me, talking about how compressed all the ske- all the standings are. So because the Swiss style scheduling, Cuba and Trinidad and Tobago will play a home and home in the next window. Trinidad and Tobago has not looked great. Cuba has gotten some results. If Cuba can find a way to get two wins over Trinidad, they're sitting on eight points, which might be enough to get, get them through from a position where they're, they haven't won a game yet. Um, Donald, is there a matchup or a team that you've got your eye on for this October window? Well, first of all, I think when you look at who everyone has to play, if you lay that out, which I obviously have, and you compare group A to group B, they look very similar. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, the fourth place team and the sixth place team in both groups have a home and home next month. Uh, on the other side, it's, uh, it's Guadalupe and Martinique. They're playing, you know, home and home next month. So I, it's interesting how that worked out. Um, consequently, you also at the top, you have Suriname who has two home games next month. And then you also have Nicaragua with two home games next month. But then conversely, you have Guatemala and Honduras who are on the road twice. And I think that part is interesting because I'm sure that they're leaving out, you know, they're, you know, they're hoping that they can get a bunch of points, but they may be lamenting some of the points that were left on the table this month because they have to go on the road uh, and and try to grind out two results to keep pace with some of the other teams that are around them. So, you know, if you're looking at some of these teams, right, you know, Suriname playing at home twice, especially how, you know, how difficult it is for teams to get there that poses an advantage to them. And maybe they capitalize on that and move up from third place into one of those top two spots. You mentioned Suriname, and it reminds me that we forgot to talk about something in the storylines. Did you see the ha- at halftime of the Guiana Suriname match that they had to delay the second half because the president of Guiana arrived in a helicopter on yes. the field? <laughs> I saw that. Uh, that was well, I you know it was one I'm of those sorry to our that... audience for not mentioning that sooner. That should have been a no. headline top story. No, no, it it skipped my mind because when it was a halftime, right? I like kind of like would deviate to another game and kind of again I had like a huge setup going on. So when that was happening, I kind of muted it and then like turned my attention to a game that was on my TV or something like that, right? And then when I looked back, I was like, "What's the helicopter doing there? Did, like somebody <laughs> get like." Does somebody get airlifted? Like, what's going on? No, nope. mm-hmm. it was the president. So, yeah. hey, you, again, CONCACAF, you never knew. You know, he didn't drop money from there <laughs> like we've seen in some games. Um, was Guiana, that was Guiana's president, not Suriname's president. So. Yeah, well, also, LA, you know, Las Vegas Lights do it too. Like, they used to do it every game. Um, these have llamas on the field and shit. So, um, it, it's, it, yeah, again, CONCACAF, anything can happen, but um, did not – think that a game would be delayed because the president decided I would like to come. Um, And the only way I can do this is to land my chopper. Yeah. As you might've known from our CONCACAF laser focus on Guyana, it's a lot of oil money going on now. So now the president's flying around in a chopper. It's like, yeah, I can make the second half. We we can get there. It's Mm -hmm. a big game. It's nation's league. I got to be there for my country. So he was one of the 500 announced in attendance. Yeah. For that match in Leonora. Um, any closing thoughts on the September Nations League window? I last this time last year was about the time that we were kind of like gambling on where the United States would play. I can't gamble on what's going on oh, right yeah. now because it's too close. Um, and maybe as we get closer, it's going to be really uh, those first matches next month. And I know we'll talk about it in a couple of weeks, but just to give you guys a preview of what those matches are, the first uh, matches in each group, the first match day. Uh, on December 10th is Group B, Nicaragua against Jamaica, Cuba against Trinidad and Tobago, and French Guiana against Honduras. Then you have on October 11th, Suriname against Costa Rica, 
Guadalupe against Martinique and Guyana against Guatemala. So that will maybe create some separation here. And at least for American fans, Mexican fans, Panamanians and Canadians, they will start to be able to see kind of how this might shape out, not like to a T, but at least maybe get some some sort of separation from the Peloton uh, and the rest of the pack. That's what we're looking for here. But again, we we will talk about that a lot later. I think it's going to be interesting how those games really play out because, you know, some teams could put themselves in prime position and some teams could throw themselves right back out of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, we look forward to the Nations League window in October. We look forward to the Nations League quarterfinals in November. And getting his first, we, we should talk about the other big story of the four non-competing the four people with four teams getting a bye to the nation's league quarterfinals uh the u.s hired a coach finally uh, mauricio pochettino finally under contract and announced as the next u.s men's national team head coach uh donald you want to talk about how you feel about it yeah you know it's funny i I, I, I'm not an EPL. I don't have an EPL team, so I don't have the biases that other people do when they talk about Mauricio Pochettino. Of course, he he spent a long time at, at Spurs. He spent some time at Chelsea, uh, been to PSG, Espanol, uh, Southampton uh, before he came to uh, the United States. And and so when I think about him playing, he's played in some, you know, he's coaching some big games, right? He He's Argentine. He's played in some big games. He has that, he's a big name coach. And a lot of fans wanted a big name coach. Did they maybe want this guy? Maybe not, but I think he's as great a hire as you could possibly get. He's making $6 million. So uh, Mauricio Pochettino, if you'd like to sponsor a, a pod, um, podcast add us at podcast. Um, Cause apparently you got some, got some bread that you can distribute, but I, I think the United States is, is in a bind here because they need to, really show that they are ready to host the world cup. And for some reason over the last couple of months, they have regressed quite a bit. Uh, and even in this window, they got a loss and a draw um, against Canada and New Zealand. That is, that is something as the United States, when they're, when people are thinking we should be competing with the top 10 teams in the world, those two are very much not. And we were not able to get solid victories against them or even any victory against them. Pochettino has his work cut out for him to get these guys to start believing once again that they are the team that we thought they were. Uh, and that might be the biggest challenge of any coach uh, in the world right now is to try and figure out how to make them believe that they are the kings of CONCACAF and that they are you know, the world beaters, that they're the only team that's ever held the Nations League trophy and ever will. Like They have to believe that again. And they have a couple of friendlies. That, you know, next month they play... Uh, they host Panama, and then they go on the road to Mexico, uh, to Guadalajara. But then Nations League quarterfinals is in November, and he gets his first taste of that. And how does he prepare for that? How does he react to that? And how does he get this team going over the next couple of years? Yeah. Um, for me, I think this window you saw the U.S. lost to Canada and Kansas City. Very listless performance. Like The guys just were not up for it, which was frustrating knowing that, you know, I don't necessarily think that Canada like came Canada was who we thought they were. Right. And the U S just came out and went, was going through the motions. Like you can't do that against a motivated team with a motivated coach who are out there to prove something like the U S just showed up in their fan appreciation match and just did not look, they, they, look like I didn't they feel appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They looked like they did not want to be there. And um, I mean, it's just a friendly. It doesn't mean anything. But the vibe around the team has, from the Nations League final in March to now, like the vibes are down significantly around the U.S. team. And you also saw it like they, they drew New Zealand and Cincinnati, another uninspiring performance with some of the B team players kind of mixed in. Um, yeah, Poch has some work to do ahead of Nations League. There's one other thing that I think was missing from this window. It's been missing all summer from the United States men's national team. Tyler Adams. Uh, even uh, no, this has had nothing to do with any individual player. It's a it's a 
common theme that has developed over the last few months. And that is there is no sense of urgency and yeah. that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, again, you mentioned that these were friendlies and that they didn't matter. No, they matter in the sense that it, it, they're not official competitions, but they matter in the sense that I wanted to see these guys come out after what they weren't able to do in Copa America and say, Hey, every game means something. Every game is important to us. And we are going to play every game like it is the group stage of a world cup, because you could see a New Zealand in the world cup. You can see a Canada like team in the world cup and you have to be prepared. You can't just say, Oh, this, this team's coming and we're playing at home. It's whatever you have to approach every single game. Like Canada approached us, right? Like you mentioned, they were motivated. They they decided that this game meant something and, and they were going to play as if it meant something. And if you have to make that up, um, if you have to do the whole Jordan, like, you know, somebody didn't get my sandwich right and I took it personally, like, do that. But Pochettino has to figure out a way to rebuild that urgency because that has disappeared very quickly and it's been the most glaring omission from the United States men's national team. Yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot here. All right, so Poch, he get he gets the October window, some friendlies. He gets to go to Guadalajara. November, he meets Concacaf Nations League. What do you think is like the most extreme destination that the U.S. could go play in, where Poch is going to be like, "What the fuck am I doing here?" Suriname. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Suriname. Suriname. Okay. Yeah. And Ronnie Brung which sho- shows up, <laughs> like by horse brigade. Or some some random wild stuff. And Pochettino's like, I am not in Kansas anymore, nor am I at Stanford Bridge. Um, that's as clearly the one. Like, it, yeah. yeah, you go to an island, he's going to an island. He's gonna he's gonna yeah. appreciate that. Um, but you go to some place where you got a, a a charter flight is still not gonna get you there. They gotta like your your pilot's like, yo, where are we going? They gotta file a new flight plan, like that sort of thing. That's where that's where that will that will be his welcome to the Nations League moment. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I I think I'm in the same neighborhood. I was going to go French Guiana. It's like, wait, yeah. we're going where? We're going to South America? Cool. Wait, they're, we're not playing a real team? Like, they are they're not even a real country? They're not FIFA? Like, we're not going to play them qualifying or ever again? Like, one where he has to be like, oh, we're playing Suriname. Oh, wait, we're Suriname. And someone has to, like, get out the, like, Google Maps. <laughs> like, it's here. Um, <laughs> he has to do like a quick, quick search. Oh, it's right there. Yeah. Of course. At least 12 teams. Of these 12 teams, how many do you think he has to look up on a map? Oh, several. I mean, he probably knows the big countries, like the big, like he probably knows some I, of the Central Americans, but he's I, Argentine, I he knows, so he knows a lot of those. I bet he knows Jamaica, Costa Rica, and he probably knows Honduras. He probably knows Cuba. He yeah. probably knows Honduras is in Central America. You know, Central um, America, but like, Again, he he knows Suriname and French Guiana. It's in South America. He's from South America. He just might have to re like revisit the fact that yo, I'm going to South America for a North American Conference uh, Confederations <laughs> tournament. Um, why why is this? Why is Suriname? Like he's going to ask those questions as he's on the charter flight. Um, that's probably like 14 hours to get get down there. But again, he's going to land. He's going to be like, I'm really in South America playing Concacaf Nations League. What like what are we doing? Like what is this? I I should be in Tahiti, at least, like put me somewhere, somewhere real. Get ready to learn Concacaf, brother. Get ready to learn Concacaf. It's a, it's a, it's a language we're fluent in, and we still learn every day. Yes. Um. All right. Go one on. final thing. Uh, after you know, the one thing that I wanted to mention is that we were going to talk quickly, very, very quickly, about the fact that there were several teams that debuted new jerseys in this window. Mm-hmm absolutely job well done to like almost all of them like th- there is there is very few duds in this bunch uh we are going to do we're talking about doing a full jersey episode uh because there's just so many but i want to list at least some of the people who debuted jerseys in this window u.s virgin islands we talked about those yeah aruba uh-huh. curacao Suriname, guyana french guiana puerto rico saint martin the dutch side and dominica of which Dominica, that jersey, stimulus, shout out stimulus, will probably be uh, paid for by me very, very soon, like maybe after we finish recording this. But there was just so many. And then, of course, there's like the teams that debuted over the, be their jerseys in like June. There's a lot of fire in uh, in, in CONCACAF right now when the jersey side. So we're going to have to like 
really research this and really put it all together so that we can give you an episode on just jerseys. Yeah. It's called fashion. Look it up. Fashion. All right. about that. Yes. So thank you to Stimulus and all the other companies who are making this fire new look CONCACAF for everybody. Um, Again, thank you to our patrons for supporting the podcast. Patreon.com backslash podcast. Go sign up. There's a free tier, but we really need your support to make this podcast a thing. We need, you know, to pay hosting fees and things of that nature. Starts as low as a dollar a month. Um, yeah, as low as a dollar a month, and you get a mm-hmm. one more round bonus episode with most of our episodes that we record and publish publicly. Sometimes you'll get episodes before they are available to the public. You're like the, our exclusive test group. Get um, access to our Discord, and yeah. again, when we uh, we listen to your I, feedback too. Yes, um, yeah. and so yeah, you have a lot of options, and you have always direct access to us through that Discord on things that you want to hear or see on this pod. Yeah. And you also have direct access to us on social media at podcacaf, P O D cacaf on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And Donald, you have a Twitter too? Yes. At blazing DW is my handle on Twitter. Sweet. And uh, Johnson Slape is at is J Slape SSP on Twitter. Um, you can follow him there. We'll be back with a new episode shortly. We are already inside a month to the next. Nations League window, we it's it's a wonderful time of year. You love international breaks. I saw someone talking about how international breaks are not really appreciated enough in soccer because the storylines you get, it's not like club soccer. You might get Leicester City winning the Premier League once in a hundred years, but you will get nonsense every fucking window. Every in international soccer, and especially in CONCACAF, the greatest confederation on the planet. For Eric Schmitz, for Down Line, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Hope you enjoyed the nation's league.